It's been approved unanimously. Consequently, the Organic Law for the Defense of Guyana Esquiba is declared approved. And with that, Venezuela kicked up a hornet's nest. It has once again angered its neighbor, Guyana. Caracas has declared that two-thirds of the neighboring country is a new... Since 1981, the United States has followed a policy until the last year or so we started rethinking it that we rich countries that produce a lot of food should sell it to poor countries and relieve them of the burden of producing their own food. So thank goodness they can leap directly into the industrial era. It has not worked. It's maybe been good for some of my farmers in Arkansas, but it has not worked. It was a mistake. It was a mistake that I was a party to. I am not pointing the finger at anybody. I did that. I have to live every day with the consequences of the lost capacity to produce a rice crop in Haiti to feed those people because of what I did, nobody else. Essequibo is still administered by Guyana. Caracas hasn't sent in the army to annex the territory, but by declaring it a state and saying that they have a right to defend it, Venezuela has escalated tensions and it has raised the specter of con... Minor, um, how come you guys like President Clinton so much? After all, he was... Uh, president in, in 1994, um, which is the lowest hour of their existence for sure. And this friend of mine said, well, because he said he was sorry. And uh, that was instructive the to me. Took That's place right. And they this wouldn't was, invoke the word genocide, yeah. so it didn't trigger yeah. all and the he, international. He apologized. And I think there's something uh, really, um, I don't want to say refreshing. These are too, these are too big, it's too big an issue to use a word like that. But that candor around the rice subsidies uh, I think it's welcome back to the flight hit that subscription button buddy and stay updated with everything that's trending in Guyana and the diaspora thanks now let's turn our attention to South America to Venezuela where President Nicolas Maduro is at it again Venezuela is set to go to poll soon Maduro has a tough fight on his hands so what does he do stir up trouble with the neighbor. Venezuela has a territorial dispute with neighboring Guyana. It's a small country of less than a million people and an area of about 215,000 square kilometers. But Venezuela claims over two thirds of Guyana. It claims an oil rich region called Essequibo. This dispute has existed for almost 200 years and yet it is now on the eve of elections that Venezuela has formally declared Essequibo a state, escalating tensions when it should be preparing for elections. Here's our report. It's been approved unanimously. Consequently, the Organic Law for the Defense of Guyana Esquiba is declared approved. And with that, Venezuela kicked up a hornet's nest. It has once again angered its neighbor, Guyana. Caracas has declared that two-thirds of the neighboring country is a new Venezuelan state. The region is called Essequibo. It has been the object of a two-century-long dispute, and now Venezuela has unilaterally tried to change the status quo. To add to the insult, Venezuela has named the state Guyana Essequiba. Imagine someone stealing your land and then naming it after you. Venezuela seems to be itching for a fight. Now technically, Venezuela has not taken over the land. Not yet, anyway. Essequibo is still administered by Guyana. Caracas hasn't sent in the army to annex the territory. But by declaring it a state and saying that they have a right to defend it, Venezuela has escalated tensions and it has raised the specter of conflict. So why is Venezuela doing this? Why does it claim the land? And is the claim legitimate? These are tricky questions, because the dispute is older than the countries of Venezuela and Guyana. It stretches back to the 1800s, when both nations were European colonies. Venezuela was a Spanish colony. Guyana was first a Dutch territory, then the British took over. That's when the problem began. Britain were mapping the new acquisition, they walked into Spanish territory and thought it belonged to them. They drew up new maps and Essequibo was considered a part of British Guyana. 
Basically, a mapping error has led to a centuries-long dispute, which is British colonialism in a nutshell. However it happened, Guyana has governed Essequibo for almost 200 years. The region makes up two-thirds of Guyana. So, does Venezuela have the right to take over? Should Guyana be punished for the crimes of the British? These are questions the world has been struggling with. The US played mediator back in 1899. The United Nations had their say in 1966. And in 2018, the International Court of Justice was dragged in. But Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro doesn't want outside interference. He held a dubious referendum in December and then claimed that Venezuelans wanted him to reclaim the territory. He has been sending troops to the border and expanding military bases. Now, Venezuela's parliament has formally declared Essequibo a state. Why is Maduro escalating tensions? Well, one thing to note is that Essequibo is full of oil. Guyana has also seen a boom in oil production, with the influx of firms like American giant ExxonMobil. For the last three months, Guyana has exported more oil than Venezuela. And Venezuela has the largest oil reserves in the world. Their exports have slumped because of US sanctions on Maduro. And likely competition from Guyana. So, is this a move to take out the competition? Or is it a distraction? Venezuela goes to polls in July. Reports say Maduro is losing support. So, is Essequibo a way for Maduro to unite Venezuelans behind him? There are many questions, and no one seems to have the answers. But one thing is clear, the world cannot afford another war. This one is mad, you know? He mad. How me own is you own with the same name? This is the type of thing people is do when they're trying to pick up beef and they want to start up a story, trying to create a diversion from their own situation that they got going on, allegedly. Or could it be more to this? Could it be because, you know, he's going to get a lot of attention from persons in the world? You see, we got to have a unified front at all times. Come on. There's some things we know. It's going to take some time to heal certain wounds that is going on in Guyana. But it's going to take some time as well for persons to really start to realize the amount of wealth that resides within that same little boundary that we call Guyana. And we need to realize that very, very fast because the rest of the world already realizes that. And they're moving in and they're moving in fast. And we can't allow people for just come in and plunder and then say sorry. That's not allowed. How you can create them type of disaster then? And then you can just say sorry. Let me ask you something. Like, I know we all remember they had this guy allegedly that had tried to create a situation of terror at JFK. And he was from Guyana, right? Now, nobody in the world had no kind of forgiveness for them because they don't make no sense. Why are you doing that? A lot of innocent persons are going to get hurt, right? Nobody respected that. And even though it wasn't able to pull off, right? Nobody still ain't taking sorry for them. So how we can take sorry? Look at how Haiti there right now. Look at what's going on in Haiti right now. You think there's not from repercussions of all what was going on then, right? Look at what's going on in Rwanda right now. Allegedly, all of these situations might have ricocheted from things that would have, you know, been caused back then. So how are we going to just say, oh, sorry, and just let that be? We can't just take sorry just like that. That's not how things go. And it's not just one person that's run a government on either side, allegedly. Right? So let's contemplate on all of that. And let's rationalize on all of that as persons that are... Guyanese, we cannot be divided. We have to hold one unified love for one another. I want to see the benefit of every person that is dear. Because if we don't, they're going to play both sides to the center. They're going to play both sides to the center because watch the UN all to watch in the country right now. Not to say that there's not certain things that they should be looking at. But 
we got to remember that there's certain things that the UN should be acting on that they might not even be acting on presently. And it's not just in situations where it's melanated people related. It's a lot of other situations too. So we got to now hold this in our minds. And as we know, we know, the ones that are old enough, we know that 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago, all these persons didn't have this much interest in what we call Guyana right now. So we end up on that beefing and them thing no more. We got left alone and start taking steps forward. We got to start taking steps forward and mending them things from the past. Them misguided approaches that we had to dealing with one another. From the past, we can left them thing in the past, buddy. We got to left them thing in the past and move forward. Me saying moving forward with any one political party because, look, we're dealing with persons that in race baiting. We're dealing with persons that is for the benefit of the whole country. We're dealing with persons that are for the betterment of our Guyanese. We don't care what's the alphabet and the letters that come before you. We just want to know that you're a good son or daughter of the soil and you're ready to serve the people honestly. That's all. I mean, we're not going to be here forever. We want to enjoy the best life that we can while we're here. Right? That's all it's about. So we don't want to hear sorry for all of that type of tragedy. And we don't want the same thing repeated here. We don't want the same thing repeated in Guyana. And they said those who forget the past are forced to repeat it. And we ain't forgetting this past. Because guess what? We got a lot of wealthy brothers and sisters in the country that's make the money off of agriculture. So when persons that doing them type of thing and destroying the whole agricultural industry, we really watching them because guess what? We the food basket to the Caribbean and the chairman of CARICOM, the Honorable President Ali, is who he's coming to meet with. Let's get right into what Bill Clinton has to say right now and what was reported internationally about the incident he was involved in. We're spending the hour with Dr. Paul Farmer, who is co-founder of Partners in Health, university professor at Harvard University, runs the Global Health Social Medicine uh, Department of Harvard Medical School, and has just written a new book called Haiti After the Earthquake. Paul Farmer is also the deputy UN special envoy under President Clinton, which brings me, Paul, to President Clinton. Um, President Clinton, the UN special envoy to Haiti, shortly after assuming the position, publicly apologized for forcing Haiti to drop tariffs on imported subsidized U.S. rice during his time in office. The policy wiped out Haitian rice farming, seriously damaged Haiti's ability to be self-sufficient. Clinton apologized in March 2010 at a hearing before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Since 1981, the United States has followed a policy until the last year or so we started rethinking it. That we rich countries that produce a lot of food should sell it to poor countries and relieve them of the burden of producing their own food. So thank goodness they can leap directly into the industrial era. It has not worked. It may have been good for some of my farmers in Arkansas, but it has not worked. It was a mistake. It was a mistake that I was a party to. I am not pointing the finger at anybody. I did that. I have to live every day with the consequences of the lost capacity to produce a rice crop in Haiti to feed those people because of what I did, nobody else. That was President Clinton in 2010. You were already working under him as Deputy UN Special Envoy to Haiti. Uh, did you write some of those words? Did I, you I, influence what he has to say? And talk about the significance of this. Well, I, I would have been proud to have written those words. Um, and I, I felt a sense of great relief just at hearing him say that. I did not, however, write those words. And I just would go back a little bit to um, the work that I've been lucky enough to do with him. It's almost all been healthcare work, um, in mostly in Rwanda, Malawi, Lesotho, and setting policies. We, we were going to start in Haiti, um, and uh, this is in 2002. He had launched the Clinton HIV 
AIDS initiative, which is now the Clinton Health Access Initiative, which is basically to move forward access to health care for people living in poverty. Um, and focuses, uh, it started out around AIDS, but it was never uh, anything other than to, to move forward uh, these, this broad, comprehensive model of care that, that we use at Partners in Health as well. So our work um, was really around uh, health care. And in 2008, he was in Rwanda to break ground on what was, I'm happy to tell you, is a beautiful new hospital in northern uh, Rwanda on the Uganda border. It actually was the site of a military base, so it's kind of the ultimate in swords into plowshares. You should come and visit. So he was there, but he was talking a lot about Haiti um, in Rwanda. And right after that, the uh, third of or the second of four storms smashed in Haiti, and I was down there. And, um, and this is about the time we started talking about working together more in Haiti. So by March, when he made those comments, we had been spending a, a lot of time together uh, a little bit before and, and, of course, after the earthquake, he was there in Haiti or working on Haiti every day. So when he said that uh, to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, I had just done testimony there maybe two or three weeks earlier. Uh, in which I argued, again, that we have not just to build Haiti back better, but to build foreign assistance and humanitarian, the machinery back better. Um, I, was, uh, uh, I was watching as he said that. Uh, anyway, just one other thing I want to say uh, while we're on the topic. In Rwanda, um, I once asked a, a friend of mine, uh, um, how come you guys like President Clinton so much? After all, he was uh, president in, in 1994. Uh, which is the lowest hour of their existence, for sure. And this friend of mine said, well, because he said he was sorry. And uh, that was instructive to me. The genocide took That's place, right. and they this wouldn't was, invoke the word genocide, yeah. so it didn't trigger yeah. all and the he, international He apologized, and I think there's something uh, really, um, I don't want to say refreshing. These are too, these are too big, it's too big an issue to use a word like that. But that candor around the rice subsidies, uh, I think it's healthy. Uh, it, and I, I feel grateful for it as an American. So too. he was criticizing his own neoliberal policies, right. right, of this flooding of the country with rice from the United States, and then that wipes out the farmers. They come into the cities, they're looking for jobs, and then you have the situation of a, uh, of assembly factories, of sweatshops, and you know lowered wages. Um, She's ready. Stay ready, Mister. The ultimate male supplement, men's total wellness formula, packed with essential nutrients for men's health. She'll call you Mr. C. You guys give critics five million dollars? Is this real or is a prank boss? No disrespect. No. Oh, the man come here and said, Pops, I need five million dollars to, to go and um, settle with his family. You know? Oh, yeah. We gave him the $5 million. Cash, he cash money. Nothing. $5 million cash. Oh, my God. Boss. I'll tell you the name. I'll tell you the 